So, uh, as uh, Beth has mentioned, my name is Jeremy Kerr. I am from Perth in Australia, and that's, uh, that's why I talk funny. Uh, I, as, uh, as Beth said, I work in the Linux Technology Center. Uh, my, my main area is uh, Linux, uh, Linux and firmware on, on open power machines. So I wanted today to give a bit of a, a background on some of the key areas or some of, some of the interesting areas that, uh, that, that we've developed for, for open power platforms uh, and what they mean for, for someone who's looking to, to integrate or to implement uh, an open power machine. So... Those areas that I want to talk about, uh, firstly, a bit about our runtime Linux implementation, uh, as much as we can sort of squeeze into 10 minutes of a talk today. A bit about the, the way we boot, so the way we boot your, uh, your actual host OS, so like the, the thing that you want to use as your workload, and a little bit about the, the management processor implementation uh, on uh, Open Power Machines. So first up, uh, about the, the runtime Linux interface. Um, of course, everything here is open source. Uh, we have everything in our tree, uh, in the, the standard Linux tree, uh, using the, the standard open uh, Linux PowerPC platform support. So the, the open power uh, code lives in a, a platform directory. So under, under the PowerPC tree, we have, we have a set of different platforms. Uh, we can build them into what we call a multi-platform kernel. So a single build can boot on on an open power machine or a, an IBM power machine or a, a G5. So we have this, this concept of platforms and we use this power NV platform definition for, for open power machines. Now that provides uh, a couple of things. Firstly, a, a method of the hardware to describe itself to the operating system and that is by a, a, a device tree. Here's a little sample of, of what goes into a device tree. It's a, uh, it is a tree structure, it has nodes. Those nodes may have subnodes with key value pairs in it. And we use that to describe how the platform is, is laid out in hardware, things like how many CPUs are present, how much memory is present, how everything's connected up so that the, uh, uh, the, the kernel can, can probe that and cons construct a running, running operating system to, uh, to work on that platform. And that all happens at runtime. So it's all discovered at runtime. The platform, configures it, the, the platform code configures itself based on this device tree description of, of the machine. The, the second part that this platform description provides is uh, some abstractions for, uh, for the runtime interfaces, anything, anything that needs to happen at runtime to perform some sort of action uh, that the, the kernel may want to do. So we have what we call a, the open power abstraction layer, or OPAL, and that provides uh, some, some runtime callbacks for the kernel, kernel platform code to call. Now this exists on the machine as firmware, and it, it, it means that we, we don't need to have a lot of low-level code in that platform code in the kernel. We can, we can rely on that Opal, Opal layer to provide some of the hardware-specific methods of doing things. So it's a little layer uh, in the kernel, shipped as machine firmware, and of course, all open source. So we have our repository on the, the Open Power project on GitHub. The, the API for this is in a single header file. Uh, it's, it's quite a straightforward sort of uh, interface. Uh, and we basically have a, a whole set of functions that, that the platform code in the kernel can call into to do some, some low-level things. So this is, this is from the header file. This is a few of the, the, uh, the definitions of, of the, the callbacks that Opal provides. In this case, we have, for example, a, a console write, console read, real-time clock read write, and they're all just tokens in, a, in our header file. Each one of those, these is described by a, um, a little document, little text document, that uh, says, for, so in this case, the, the console write call, it takes a few parameters, returns some different values, and has a bit of a description. So we have most of this Opal API documented in, in a similar sort of format for, uh, for, the, um, for that lower level Opal firmware. Now, I say lower level, but it's more of a, um, a library design. It, it, there's, unlike x86 firmware, Opal doesn't, have any, any, doesn't handle any interrupts directly itself. There's no hidden system management mode. Uh, the only entry point that Opal has is when the, the Linux kernel calls into it. So there's no stolen time. There's no, there's no uh, missing cycles. Everything that Opal does is, is on behalf of the kernel. So in that regard, it's more like a library that the kernel uses rather than a separate layer of firmware that the kernel that sits underneath the kernel. So always, always uh, uh, invoked on, on behalf of Linux. Uh, and we have a fixed calling convention there. It is 64-bit Big Endian. That has no effect on, on the actual kernel itself. 
we actually we run little NDN kernels uh, with this Opal firmware. It will simply switch NDN as we enter enter into this library firmware. So a bit of a diagram here. For our, our standard machine here, we have a Linux kernel and a workload on top. We have the PowerNV platform code, which is responsible for configuring the platform, for configuring the kernel for that platform. We have our little Opal layer uh, that does all the hardware abstractions. And the interface between these two is described by a, um, a specified API. And that, that's kind of how our, our kernel is implemented. There's a few extra bits involved. Uh, we have um, open power specific drivers. Now these are uh, standard Linux device drivers that provide standard Linux devices on top of that Opal layer. So using that example before, we had the, the console write uh, Opal, Opal call. We use that to provide a console device driver in Linux. So nothing, nothing really special there. It, it's a standard Linux console device that just happens to back onto, onto the Opal firmware. And again, the, the, the functionality that Opal provides is just a light layer above, above the hardware. So if we update our diagram from earlier, we have the power of the kernel port, the Opal, but then we have a, a few extra drivers that, that talk into that Opal API. And that, that's kind of the, the core of it. Now, as I mentioned before, Opal is, is fairly small, very library-like interface. One thing that, that is missed or is, is absent from it in comparison to x86 firmware is the way to boot your, your host kernel. So there's none of that support is present in, in the OpenPower firmware. Now, rather than writing all of that infrastructure ourselves, we thought that reuse is a good thing. So we have a um, what we call petty boot. This is our, our booting UI. Um, this is what happens when you boot your machine. You get this... Uh, this, this dialogue coming up on, the, uh, on the, the console with some options to boot. Now, we can actually exit out of that, that UI and uh, enter a standard Linux shell. So this is all still running from firmware. We haven't loaded any code off disk or anything like that. We have a little embedded Linux system uh, that exists in, in firmware that is responsible for the boot services of the machine. So it does things like look for the disks that are present uh, and, and find bootable options like we see here, and then is responsible for booting into those after, after reading configuration. So by using Linux here, we can, we can reuse all of that existing core code that is already out there in the community. We don't need to rewrite that for our specific firmware. So for example, you know, we have the Opal firmware support, we have the device drivers, we have the network stack, we have all the network protocols, we have all the disk drivers, and all the, all the bits that, that we would need to write boot services. Rather than writing it, we just borrow them from Linux and have that as our, our bootloader. So, as I said, we have a, um, one, one of the, the, the benefits of doing this is it means that rather than having fairly hard to debug firmware code as your boot services, it's now just all user space code. So anyone who's familiar with, with developing a, a Linux user space application is now enabled to, to alter the bootloader or to, to do anything with our, our firmware, our boot management process simply by, by working on this, this petty boot project, which is a standard user space uh, application. Again, open source. It's in our, our GitHub uh, repository for, for OpenPower. Now, a few, a few little quick items on, on, our, um, on the management controllers for, for the existing OpenPower platforms out there at the moment. So the, the concept here is, is we want to go the, the path of fewest surprises. So we have a an industry standard um, basement management controller on these machines, which uses all the usual methods of, uh, of power control, of, of, of logs, of, of error collection, that sort of thing. So we have, again, a, a, some, a, a piece of hardware running firmware that you're familiar with for a, for a BMC uh, without, with a few surprises. Um, we, have, we do have a few additions to that firmware that's specific to open power machines. Um, but if, if you're doing a deployment of an open power cluster, you often will not need to use any of these at all. But, but we, are, we are documenting those and, and watch this space for, uh, for that list of, of, sort of OEM commands that might be specific to power. Now, uh, Chris Austin is going to disrupt all this and he's going to give us a talk about that uh, soon. So um, that'll be quite, uh, quite interesting to see what we're sort of bringing this into the open source space. So that's a uh, tip for the day. Thank you very much. And, uh, some resources for uh, for following up on this, or uh, have a chat after the uh, after the session. Thank you.